Well, thank you all. Appreciate your leadership as always. And as always, just a reminder, if we can be praying for you about something in particular, you want to let us know, you sure can. An email to prayers at westwoodchurch.net uh, or one of those physical prayer request sheets on your way out. You can put them in the silver bowls. And, and we only lift up prayer requests in public that are given permission for that, just so you know. So those things are kept uh, more private. Um, but if there is something that we could be praying for you about, please feel free to let us know. So I was thinking the other day, a few years ago, some friends and I just kind of, we were hanging out one night. We ended up getting a kind of an impromptu argument or I'll say maybe a spirited debate or conversation about what the best sport is. Now, it's been a few years. I think it was around the World Cup time because it started with my friend Ben saying, you know, I think, I think soccer is the best sport out there. And he was saying, you know, first of all, the physical endurance, the agility, the toughness, the strategy that it takes. And, and he said, you know, beyond that, Soccer is one of those sports that all kinds of people can excel at. Men and women can compete at a really high level. It brings people around the world, like different communities. This is why I think it was around the World Cup, because I think he was talking about this. It can bring communities and countries together. The whole world gets united around the World Cup. Uh, you can see his arguments were a little bit more altruistic than purely athletic. And I want to speak carefully, because my wife is a good soccer player and a big fan. But shortly after that, my other friend Tim said, now listen... That's fine. Soccer's good. But basketball is the best sport ever. He said, if you ever go to an NBA game, he's talking about, you know, the men's NBA games. He said, this will be beyond a shadow of a doubt. These 10 huge men in this small rectangle doing amazing things. Fast, strong, quick, jumping, accuracy and shooting, passing, scheming. It's a thing of beauty. If you go to a game, you'll never doubt again. At which point I said, you two cannot be serious right now. Are you really trying to tell me you don't know football is the best sport ever invented? It's the perfect blend of strength, speed, agility, mental toughness, physical toughness, individual battles the whole way around, whole team battles, endurance. Stress. We can disagree. Football's the best, right? You can imagine how things went after that. Not great. We continued to debate endlessly, and at the end of it, nobody really won. We all lost. I mean, I like to think I won, but I didn't. Because we know that there are some things in life that are not provable because they're just a matter of preference and opinion like that. So there isn't one answer to some questions that's more right, more true than other answers. <clears throat> However, it is really common in our day, but not just in our day, to take that same logic and then apply it to other questions that are similar and that they can't be proved, but are not the same. And when that happens, that leads to some very confused outcomes. And in particular, many people in our day and age believe that because something is not provable, then that must mean that any and all perspectives on the matter are equally true and right and valid. And this is, of course, especially true when, when we come to speak of things that we call metaphysics, the things that make up the ultimate basis of our existence but are beyond the realm and scope of empirical science and proof. In other words, the world of faith and the world of religion. And everyone has faith, even an atheist. And everyone has a religious belief. Even the most ardent nihilist you'll ever meet. Believer in utter nothingness. Now, I'm sorry, I recognize we just jumped into the deep end without warning and without even me telling you to put your floaties on. Sorry about that. We're talking about, you know, a good-hearted argument about sports and then we're talking about metaphysics. But what I mean is this. It's very common. In fact, it's often simply assumed and it's just so powerful because it is assumed and not questions. That when it comes to the nature of God, the existence of God, the particulars about who God is, since we're in the territory of things that can't be proven empirically, that must mean we're at the level of preference or opinion, like the best sport. Meaning that there is no answer that's more right or more wrong than any other. So what we believe in, the, sp the specifics doesn't really matter as long as we don't impose on anyone else's preferences. I'm here to tell you, I, I think that that's a category mistake. <laughs> that's not merely the matter of preferences just because it can't be proved. Not being provable is not the same as saying nothing is more or less true than any other thing. I mean, if we just take the most basic example of belief, I think you'll know what I mean. Some people believe that God exists and some people believe that God does not exist. But our belief on the matter, my feelings, my preference does not change whether one or the other is true. It is true or not true regardless of my involvement. Similarly, the, the, res excuse me, the resurrection of Jesus. After he was suffering under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and buried, he was raised today on the third, raised to life on the third day. Either he was actually bodily raised out of that grave or he wasn't. 
They're not both true. One of them is true, and what I believe about it does not change it one bit. Even though we can't prove that, strictly speaking. I think I'd make the case, even the most basic logic of a small child can reason enough to know that this is how it works. But we think makes all the difference in the world. And the very reality of God's existence and our rightful place in the world is what the Bible claims is the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of making any sense at all of how to live well in the world. Now it doesn't stop there. The Bible has a lot to say about how to relate to God, how to relate to others, how to relate to the world around us. But again, what we think, what we believe, starting with the basic belief in God's existence and moving outward in details from there, absolutely will shape what we do how we feel, and ultimately what we give the best of ourselves to. To put that differently, what we think will have drastic changes, will cause drastic changes, will have a dramatic impact on the sorts of people we become. Which is why the focus of this week's part in our series about being made new is focus on the importance of renewing our mind. That is a non-negotiable ingredient to seeing our whole lives transformed for good. Now this is something the Bible often just assumes throughout its pages, but there are a couple of key passages where it's made really clear. And one of those that we're going to read today is from Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 17 through 24. It's page 897 in these Bibles if you want to look it up, or else we will have words on the screen as always. But in this, we call the book of Ephesians, it's a letter that Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, and it's broken up in our version into six chapters. The first half is Paul telling these people who were formerly Gentiles, not part of the covenant community of God's people called Israel, that now through Christ, they've been engrafted in, and God is making one new humanity out of these two who were previously divided. And then in chapter four, he starts saying, and now here is how you are to live as a part of this new humanity. And it's in the middle of that conversation that he writes these very important words. So would you stand please as I read these out loud? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24 says this. With the Lord's authority I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed, closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception, or as it sometimes says, by deceitful desires. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. My friends, this is God's word to us today. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, thank you indeed for your word. We pray that it would teach us, that it would form us, that it would do a part of the work of renewing our mind through our focus on it and its message to us today. May that be so. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Okay, so after reading that, I think the first thing I need to do is just kind of name out loud how shockingly offensive Paul's words might seem. I mean, if we actually kind of let it soak in what he's saying here, I think we'll agree that this is a bit of an unpopular proposition for him to make. Because he says outright that there are other people, he's talking about the Gentiles, whom this church in Ephesus used to be, most of them used to be. He says, because of their belief, their view, their thinking about God, they are hopelessly confused, our translation says. In the New International Version, which is what I've used to internalize most of Scripture over my life, he says, I tell you this, I insist on it in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do. He says, in the futility of their thinking. And he goes on to say that they are separated, they're darkened in their understanding, they are separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. And if you follow that progression, Paul is simply saying these folks are not experiencing the life that God wants. And it's because they have a messed up thinking about who God is and what is right and what the world is supposed to be like and how they're supposed to relate to God and one another. 
And he's telling them, you used to buy into that way of thinking. But not anymore. So don't drift back into it and become convinced. Uh, don't drift back into what you've become convinced is a false way of believing and then living accordingly. If you think about that, that's a pretty direct way of putting it. I mean, it seems a little bit presumptuous. Therefore, it might seem a little bit insulting or offensive to our modern sensibilities. But I got to tell you, I don't think it was much better back then. The first century Roman world was a pluralistic society also, one where there were lots of different competing beliefs, and it was generally assumed that each one was just sort of an option that you would take, or maybe based on where you lived, you would worship in a particular way, a particular understanding of God. And everyone just kind of said, well, that's fine. You choose what you choose. And so I don't think Paul's claims were a whole lot less offensive back then compared to what they may seem now. Now, let me just be very clear. Paul's intention is not to insult or offend anyone. And he's not just trying to be a jerk and saying, well, it's fine because I'm right, so I can do whatever I want. Like, there's actually quite a bit of that in the world, and that is not what he's saying. Now, he is warning these Ephesian Christians that he loves. If you follow the story of the first church in Acts or piece together other bits of the New Testament, you'll see Paul has a very special connection to this church in this city of Ephesus. He spent years there. He sent his protege in the faith, Timothy, there to guard them, to shepherd them, to guard the truth and the life that they're sharing together. He, <clears throat> excuse me, he sacrificed for this church. He literally suffered for these people. He labored for them tirelessly. And so he's warning people that he loves that they need to continually renew their minds rather than lapse back into former ways of thinking because there actually really are things that are true on the one hand and not true on the other. And it doesn't do anyone any good to pretend that that isn't true. It's not loving. That's not good. That's not wise in any way, shape, or form. So while his claim here may seem a little bit direct, far from being insulting or rude, it's actually quite respectful, quite loving. Because he's being honest about the nature of these kinds of things. And in a way that we all know is actually true if we think about it for a second. And he's doing that rather than play like a patronizing game meant to establish or preserve like a false sense of peace that we know is kind of a farce. He's saying that there actually are right ways to think about God and not right ways to think about God. And that matters because it will drastically impact how we live. And he says here, whether we actually experience the life that God intends. You see, it is actually possible for people, including any one of us or any group of us, to wander from the life God gives because we have closed our minds and hardened our hearts against God. You know, I've said this before. So much of life is determined by whether we harden our hearts when we experience pain or fear or harden our hearts in anger or whether we allow our hearts to remain soft and open and vulnerable despite the risks open to God and open to correction from God in his love <coughs> but it's possible for any one of us to wander far from the life God gives because we close our minds and harden our hearts and you know I, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier I think that there's an assumption out there held by many people that the ideas and philosophies that are debated in the so called ivory tower just kind of stay there that there are academic folks who argue about big words and big things. But at the end of the day, no one really cares and it doesn't really make any difference to ordinary, everyday folks. But I want to tell you something. That is simply false. <laughs> that is not true. That is an illusion that we may have. But it is not true. There was actually a, a historian kind of philosopher in the late 20th century who put it this way. The killing fields of Cambodia come from philosophical discussions in Paris. Now, don't get hung up on the particulars there about violence in Cambodia or philosophy in France. His point was that ideas spread and metastasize, sometimes and often even for good, but sometimes and often even for evil. They don't stay ideas in one place or merely remain theoretical. They do, in fact, reach around the world and to the common ordinary folks who are on street corners and classrooms and homes everywhere. So here's what follows from that. Being half-hearted, or haphazard in what we think and believe about God and what matters most, about what a truly good and beautiful life is like, 
Being half-hearted about that is not a harmless or neutral thing. Because aligning our minds with reality on the things that matter most makes all the difference in the world. Matter of fact, if you hear anything today, please hear this. No matter how powerful the impulse may be, to just kind of, you know, based on our day and age, throwing up our hands, throwing in the towel, giving up on thinking and believing rightly because there's so much information out there at our fingertips, more than a generation ago could have imagined access to. And because there are so many people who seem to be able to kind of make a case for their way of looking at things and anybody can do that. And so it kind of seems exhausting to dive in and actually discern what is right and good and true. I urge you to resist that temptation at all costs. The temptation to just give up because it seems overwhelming. Because what we believe absolutely matters. It changes everything. While none of us is going to understand God or the world around us perfectly, that doesn't mean that getting closer to what's actually right doesn't matter or isn't worth it. So at the beginning of, uh, of his magnum opus book called The Divine Conspiracy, Dallas Willard tells a story about uh, a fighter pilot who was in training. And while she was in training, at one point, she decided to make a maneuver where she was going to have a steep ascent. And so she was flying along and made a hard move on the control stick to move vertically. But instead, what she didn't recognize was throughout the training, she had been flying upside down at one point and never rightly uh, flew right side up. And so when she went to make that maneuver, instead of going up, she went straight down and tragically crashed. So Dallas goes on to say, this is a parable of human existence in our times. And it was a true story, by the way. <clears throat> he says, not exactly that every person is crashing, though there is enough of that. But most of us as individuals and world society as a whole live at high speed and often with no clue to whether we're flying upside down or right side up. Indeed, we are haunted by a strong suspicion there may be no difference, or at least it is unknown or irrelevant. Now to go back to the tragic example of that fighter pilot, she did not need to be perfectly right side up before making that maneuver to have it end very differently than it did when she was completely upside down or even mostly upside down as she tragically did. So getting as close to right side up as possible really matters. But I think that all leads to the inevitable question, how do we do that? How do we learn to fly right side up? How can we know what really is true about these things that we can't prove empirically? How can we conform our way of thinking to what is really true and good and right? And at this point, I'm afraid there's no way around heading to or towards some of the more controversial claims of the Christian faith. It's not controversial to talk about love and kindness, and we should rightfully talk about those things. That is the center of who Jesus is and the God who Jesus reveals. But... The Christian faith makes the claim that God is uniquely and authoritatively revealed to us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And what that means is, rightly understanding Jesus, and we're going to get to that in a second, <clears throat> but when we rightly understand who God is through Christ, through his words, through his actions, through his death and resurrection, and then we come to a view of God or reality that does not align with that, that means we are out of line with reality. That means we are wrong and in need of correction. And that's a good thing, to be corrected. The second thing that comes from that is that Christian faith has claimed that God uniquely and authoritatively reveals himself to us in the story of God's people as recorded in Scripture. Now, Jesus is the lens through which we view all of Scripture. It's how we make sense of some of the parts that are more difficult to make sense of because the Bible says that Jesus is the fullness of God in human form. But we understand that the rest of Scripture has much to say, rightly understood. Now, it's also worth noting that God does reveal himself to us in, in nature, out in the world. But nature, actually like the church, the imperfect group of people who commit to each other and try to follow Christ, sometimes we reveal, like nature, the reality of who God is, and sometimes we obscure who God is. And that is why we rely on the special and specific revealing of God's self that he does in the person of Jesus in the pages of Scripture. Now, with that little intro, the last few minutes that we have left here, I'm going to say some things that are probably pretty predictable, but I'm going to say them anyway. Okay? First of all, if we want to fly right side up, we simply must commit ourselves to knowing and living by the story of Scripture. For time out of mind, 
The people of Judeo-Christian faith have been called people of the book for exactly this reason, because of our dependence on the Bible as a source of divine truth and revelation. Now let me be clear about this. The focus of our faith is not the Bible. It is the living God revealed to us through Christ. And in some circles, the Bible actually becomes like an idol, like it is a God, and it is not. Our focus must remain on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the fullness of God in bodily form. But the Bible is our authoritative source of clarity on who God is. So the way I like to say it, as is on the screen, is we need to be immersed in Scripture. And I know that sometimes when that gets said, it can make a person feel a little bit overwhelmed if they're new to faith or unfamiliar with the Bible. And I got to tell you, where you're at is a great starting point. And I promise you, you can, you can do that. You can be immersed in the true story of Scripture. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, no one will do this for you. And it will take carving out time and attention to do that, which necessarily means not giving time and attention to other distractions and entertainment that are always at hand and really easy to reach for. But you really can do this. And actually, I'd say nothing else in the world makes more sense than committing to do it if we believe that it is actually God's inspired and divine revealing truth. Matter of fact, if you are in a household with it where there are others with you, a spouse or kids of any sort, you can grow together by studying the Bible together. There are tons of great tools and devotionals. Some of them we give, like we give the Jesus Storybook Bible to kindergartners. We give other resources at times. Michelle or Kara or Luke or I would be happy to pass along other resources that might be helpful. The Bible Project videos I've talked about for years are great tools. They're rich and accurate, faithful theologically, but really easy to access. They're free videos, and they're, they use accessible language and illustrations. The Chosen series on the life of Jesus that's free to stream on lots of places is also a great tool that you or your family can use to grow together, to study and focus on the Bible together. And I think at this point I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention that this is one of the reasons that participation in worship and in various classes really is worth the sacrifice and the effort it sometimes takes when other things or activities crowd in and schedule conflicts come up. The second thing I'll just briefly suggest follows from that, and that is to learn from the very best thinkers. Now, I, I personally believe you can learn something from literally anyone. And there are a lot of great thinkers who aren't people of Christian faith, and we can learn a lot of great things from them. However, if it is true that the right starting point for making sense of the world is understanding that there is a God and it's not us, and that Jesus is the fullness of God, then I think that we should really commit ourselves to learning from the very best Christian thinkers, especially. Now, <clears throat> as many of you know, I have a few of my favorites. Matter of fact, I do think my friend Drew Schultz has given me a hard time and said he's not sure if it's really one of my sermons, if Dallas Willard or N.T. Wright wasn't quoted. And that's fair because I did it today. So you know this is my work. Um, but just so you know, I also do try to learn and listen to other folks. In fact, including people I, I disagree with about a lot of things. But I do have my favorites for a good reason, I think. Uh, they are honest and faithful with Scripture. They take a humble posture acknowledging that we are not in our place and time the first people to have ever set out to actually follow Jesus. Sometimes what I hear and read would make you think that others actually think that they are. But I also have my favorites because they display a softness of heart. A love, a genuine love for Jesus and for other people even that they disagree with or who have attacked them and it just bleeds through what they write or what they say. And I think that's important to mention because lots of people who presume to teach the Bible seem to think that their supposed rightness is an excuse for meanness and cruelty or arrogance. I don't think it is. Matter of fact, I really like what a man named Preston Sprinkle has written. Somebody who's done a lot of really great writing on the also controversial issue of human sexuality. At one point he said this. He said, if we get the Bible right, but we get love wrong, we're wrong. Man, I think that's really well said. And it's directly in line, by the way, with what Jesus said, which is that we will know the trustworthiness of various supposed religious teachers by the fruit of their lives more so than the appeal of their packaging or the craftiness or even right-soundingness of their words. This is why whenever I encounter a supposed Bible teacher who seems pretty clearly to be animated by anger, animosity, rather than genuine love, 
or who seems mostly interested in the coolness of their image or the building of their personal or even organizational brand, no matter how many times they say cool things or say Jesus, I got to tell you, I make it a point to just keep moving, to find someone else to listen to and learn from. And I, I, I would humbly suggest that you do the same. No matter where you go in the days ahead, no matter who you're listening to and learning from now, that genuine love and humility really matters. I've already taken up too much time. There's so much more I want to say about this. Shocker, I know. So much more I want to say just about the passage we read, <clears throat> about the way a misunderstanding of God leads to all kinds of things. So much more I'd want to say about having an understanding of our place in the world just by reading the first few chapters of Genesis, the creation and fall narrative. But I'll just end by coming back to that same illustration. Learning to fly right side up really matters. <laughs> We can cruise through a lot of life actually not knowing whether we're flying right side up or upside down until life happens. And it always does. And then, which way we're flying will be made very clear and it will make all the difference. So may you, may we commit to knowing and living by the true story of God's word. That is the true story of God's word who is Jesus. And the pages of scripture. And on that point, I'd like to end by having you join me in a responsive reading, a confession of our faith. The, you know what I'm saying is not all my idea. I'm not the first one to have this understanding of how we ought to make our way through life. So I want to invite you to a shared responsive reading from a statement of faith called Our World Belongs to God that I think captures some of this really well. So would you stand, please? The first slide will be mine to say, and then the other two we'll all say together. God gives this world many ways to know him. The creation shows his power and majesty. He speaks through prophets, poets, and apostles, and most eloquently through the Son. The Spirit, active from the beginning, moved human beings to write the Word of God and open our hearts to God's voice. The Bible is the Word of God, the record and tool of his redeeming work. It is the Word of truth, breath of God, fully reliable in leading us to know God and to walk with Jesus Christ in new life. <laughs>